So, non-negotiables of a relationship? So I'll write, I'll write them down. You want me to, to talk about them as I write them? We, we haven't yeah. explicitly talked about like non-negotiables. Oh, wow. I don't think we ever sat down to create a list. This is what 15-year-old Stephanie had. This is the first time I made this list. <laughs> good morning, Sandals Church. Man, it is good to be with you guys today. Super excited. I want to welcome you if you're a visitor. We are starting a new series called Non-Negotiable. Here's my question. When it comes to love, what is a non-negotiable that's on your list? Some of you are married and you never talked about your list. Some of you are married, you got different lists. Write that down, married men. You wanna get on her list? You gotta know what's on her list, right? You gotta know that. Some of you never thought about it. Well, I'll just know when I know. I want you to know you should have a list. I want you to know that God has a list of what's non-negotiable when it comes to love. And we wanna challenge you during this series to find out what you really need from love, what you really want from love, because God is love and he wants to change your love life. He wants to transform, it doesn't matter if you're married, single, divorced, or widowed, God wants to teach us about love. Before we jump into the message today, I got a really, really neat thing, announcement. If you're new to Sandals, you don't know this, but we are one church in 10 locations. We have 10 campuses across Southern California, right? And today, we are moving to Central California. No longer Fres No, but Fres Yes launches today. Super excited. Some wonderful people in the Valley gave us this building. We've collected all the funds and we've done it with zero cost to the church. Isn't God good? So thank you, everybody who donated time, labor, love. Thank you so much. Their first service was packed out. Can you believe that? God is so good. So I wanna welcome everybody watching online. We love you too, even though you don't have a building. So, but feel free to give. It's okay. So how to find true love? How to find true love? Write this down. If I'm gonna find true love, I gotta accept that not all love is real. Now, if you're a teenager, write that down. You don't have to get killed by love, murdered by love. Like when you're young, just because you feel it, you assume it's real, don't you? But it's not always real. Just because somebody says, I love you, doesn't mean they love you. It might mean that they also love pizza. They also love baseball. They also love the Lakers as long as they're winning. So what happens when you're not winning? Like the pizza, they go get another meal, right? Not all love is real. Just because we use the word love doesn't mean it's real. Matter of fact, some of you, you've seen these rallies, you've seen these protests in the name of love, and they write the word love on the poster, L-O-V-E, but what it feels like is H-A-T-E. You see, just because you use the word love doesn't mean it's love. It's not always real. Tammy and I, um, we, we both did something so weird this year at Christmas. We've been married 24 years, and, and here's the thing. The longer you've been married, the more you become alike. You can try to resist it, but it just happens. And so this Christmas, I kid you not, I was so excited. Guys, listen to me. I plotted, I planned, I shopped. Yeah. That's right. I mean, on the internet, but I shopped. <laughs> and I got Tammy just this gift that I thought was so awesome. I thought she would love it. I even had one of her friends wrap it because if one of my friends wrapped it, it would look like a kindergartner wrapped it. And so one of her friends wrapped it and we opened gifts on Christmas morning, I kid you not. We got each other the same dumb thing. <laughs> right, which is cute, but it's also a waste of money. And so if you come to my house, in our, in our TV room, there is a piece of artwork that, well, we didn't hang the one I bought. We hung the one she bought. That's how marriage works, guys. <laughs> So we hung the one she bought for me, and it's on the wall, and what it is, it's a reproduction, an artist reproduction of page 187 of The Lord of the Rings. 
And J.R.R. Tolkien wrote this, not all that glitters is gold. Listen to me, people, not all that feels like love is love. Just because you feel it doesn't mean you found it. Just because you see it doesn't mean it is. I can tell you, the people that seem the most in love when they got married have had the hardest time being married. I mean, Tammy and I, years ago when we used to do weddings, we'd do it together and we'd go to all the events, you know, the family dinner and all that stuff. You know, we would go and she would always whack me about halfway through. She'd be like, you don't even love me. And she watched a husband dote over, you know, his bride. I know we said we wouldn't get each other gifts, but my love makes me a liar. I'm like, jeez, bro, you're killing me. I remember one in particular, though, this couple that they just seemed to have it for each other. They just loved each other so much. And six months later, ladies, she was in my office bawling. And she said, I've made the worst decision of my life. You see, just because you feel like it's love doesn't mean it is. Except that not all love is real. Next, you're not gonna agree with this, but pray about it. I'm right, you're wrong. This is gonna shock you, especially you guys over here. Yeah, you. <laughs> I mean, they're not gonna agree with me, but you are, right? Okay, thank you. Write it down. You'll never hear this anywhere else other than here. Not all love is good. You know why you don't believe me? Because you don't believe God. You see, in our culture, if you attach the word love to it, it has to be good, right? Love is love. No, 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 no. What determines the quality of love, listen to me very carefully, is its object. It's not do you love, listen to me, it's what do you love? A thief loves to steal. A liar loves to lie. What do you love? It is not just your love that matters, listen to me, it is the object of your love. It is the object of your love that determines its quality. The Bible teaches that not all love is good. Now, if you're a young person and you're under 30, my heart breaks for you. I think love is more complex now than ever. When I was a kid and I was dating, you just were limited by the girls in your class. And I was very short, so that limited the girls even further. Right? Tall girls, out. Because I was so short. You know, I didn't want to be like, you know, at the dance. But when I was a kid... Like you only, you only dated people that you knew. My son got a text from somebody in Russia. Russia. When I was a kid, the only thing I knew about Russia is they wanted to kill us. Now they want to date. It's hard to be a young person today. But understand this, Paul writes to a young man, Timothy, his heart breaks. And listen to me, if you're old, your heart should break for those who are young because it was easier for you. It was. But understand this, he says, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Listen to me, if you think life is hard and you're shocked, it's because you didn't read the Bible. This is what the Bible says. Some of you are new to church, so let me explain. The Bible says there was a beginning. The Bible says there will be an end. The Bible says God started it, and the Bible says God will finish it. That is where we are going. And so if, if science doesn't know, God does. Here's how it started, here's how it's gonna end, and we are progressing, moving from the beginning to the end, and we are closer to the end than we are to the beginning, so you need to get right. But understand this, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Things will be difficult for people, will be lovers. What's wrong with that? They'll be lovers of what? Self. Anybody ever fallen in love and you found out that you both are in love with the same person? You guys didn't get that, they did. What happens if you fall in love with a narcissist? Nothing good. 
They love themselves and they're just glad you joined the party. You see, people who love themselves love something that's wrong. And, and all, all of you are told today, oh, you need to love yourself. I'm just learning to love myself. I'm just needing to learn to love myself. Understand this, in the last days there will be times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Amen, parents? You're like, we're in the last times, pastor. <laughs> I love this next slew of adjectives. Right, this is a speech. They will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous. Without self-control, brutal, not loving, good. Treacherous, reckless, married couples. The next time you're in a fight, use this insult. You are swollen with conceit. I'm not fighting, I'm just being biblical. Think about that word, swollen with conceit. Gosh, that sounds gross. Oh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen to me, the world loves. We're just in love with the wrong things. Here's the problem. This love has the, the appearance of godliness, but it denies its power. Avoid such people. Some of you talk about love. You talk about God's love. You know nothing of God, and you know nothing of, 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 of love. I don't know if you've ever had a moment where, where you don't feel like you represented Jesus well. Has anybody ever had a moment like that? I had one last week. I'm not proud of it, but I'm gonna share it with you. I went to the gym, it was a Tuesday. And what I do at the gym, I do the same thing every time. I warm up on the bike, and if you're a young person, you're like, why do you warm up? <laughs> Amen, old people, one day they will know. Like my wife saw me the other day, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, getting ready to take out the trash. <laughs> Don't wanna pull a hammy. So I'm on the bike, and I'm riding, and I, and I broke one of the cardinal laws of working out at LA Fitness. I forgot my headphones, which means I have to eavesdrop of all the other conversations that are happening around me. Right, you don't wanna listen to other people's conversation, but you do, amen? How many of you do? Raise your hands. If your hand is not up, you're a liar, which is also a sin, <laughs> and we all do this. So I'm riding the bike, and three individuals come into the room. It's a private room in LA Fitness where there are just bicycles, and I go there because nobody's in there because I love people like Jesus. <laughs> and I go in there, and there's three dudes, and they come in, and my first thought is, hmm, you guys don't look like you belong in a gym. Now, I know, that's judgmental. That's what we all do, amen? We, we do it. Some of you did that today. You're like, you don't look like you belong in church. And so they came in, and they didn't, they didn't look like athletes. But they got on the bike, and they started listening to their conversation. And you know when you just, you're just catching like every other word, you're not catching the whole thing because you're trying to act like you're not listening? So I'm trying to pretend like I'm looking at my phone, but I'm really listening. And I hear God, Bible study, Jesus. And I'm like, oh man, this one guy is trying to lead these two other guys to Christ. And here's what's interesting is not only do they look like they don't belong in a gym, they didn't look like they went to church. And so I'm listening. And I hear the guy say, it's all about love, man. It's all about love. It's all about love. God loves you. God loves me. It's all about love. And he says this, God's love is effing awesome. Drops the F-bomb. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that that's an appropriate way to share the gospel, but I'm rooting for him. And then he says this, he says, hey man, do you guys smoke weed? And they said, yeah, which I was finally, like, yeah, finally, something that looks like that's what you do. <laughs> and they said, yeah, we smoke weed. He said, great, come over to my house and we will study God's word and smoke a bowl together. 
and I don't know what happened. I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden, I was a part of their small group. I was, I was no longer on my bike. Now, my wife, my wife accuses me of being intense. And I don't believe her because I never see it, right? I just, it just happens. And so I'm in the middle of these three pothead guys that are talking about Jesus. And apparently I'm intense because they're all like this. And I, I, I turn to the guy that's sharing the gospel and I say, you need to stop talking about Jesus. I was like, you don't know him and you guys are lost and this whole thing is a mess. And he goes, bro, it's all about love. It's all about love and you're not being loving. He goes, who do you think you are? I said, well, I'm a pastor. He goes, of what church? And I go, sandals. And he goes, I was like, Jesus, please don't, don't let this guy go to sandals. <laughs> I, said, where do you, I said, where do you go to church? Thank God it wasn't sandals. <laughs> but he said, man, I've been to your church. He said, you're really intense, man. And I, this is what I did. I just apologized. I said, look, guys, I apologize for my intensity. I don't want to fight. And they're like, okay. I said, I apologize to you, the guy sharing Jesus. I apologize to you, guy that doesn't know Jesus. And I apologize to you, guy who I don't think knows Jesus or these two guys, right? I, <laughs> like, did you smoke a bowl already today? <laughs> and here's what I told him. God loves you, but this guy doesn't know anything about God's love because God's love is transformative. And they said, man, weed is good. I said, no, 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 weed is, weed is witchcraft. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, well, in the Bible, when you read the Greek word for witchcraft, it's pharmakia, where we get our English word pharmacy. You don't need drugs to connect with Jesus. You need Jesus to connect with God. And I challenged him, man. I challenged him. I said, you don't know God. And I told the guy, you need to stop inviting people to your small group. <laughs> you just don't. Don't tell people about Jesus until you've met Jesus. And he said, well, I just feel like I can keep following Jesus and smoking weed. I said, I used to smoke weed. He said, what happened? I said, I met Jesus. Listen to me, if you try to convince me today that you got hit by a truck out on Palmerita and you look the same, I'm not gonna believe you. If you tell me you ran into the son of God, the creator of the universe, the one who holds the earth, makes it spin and float, and you look and act the same, I don't know that I believe you. It says they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having, listen to me, the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. If the resurrected Jesus hasn't resurrected you, he hasn't changed you. Avoid what? Such people, all of their good people, they talk about love, they talk about God, they talk about church, they don't know any of that. See, people that don't know God's word think it's all about love. Look at this next passage. Let's read the first three words together. The dot, dot, dot I put in there, that's not in the scripture. I just want you to see this as a command. Ready? What does it say? Do not what? Do not love. This is a command. Do not love. We are not called to love everything. Do not love. There's no dot, dot, dot. Do not love this world nor the things it offers. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. You gotta make a choice. Look, if God wanted you to stay the same, why did he send his son to die on the cross? Why not just send a Valentine card? Like, I think the death of Jesus is excessive if you're good. Don't you agree? Hey, son, I want you to go die. Why? I think it's a great way to send a card. 
Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way but this, let's make that happen. And the Father said, there's no other way. Let me tell you why. Your sin leads to death and someone had to die for you. And he didn't die for you so you could live the same. He died for you so you could live differently. Do not love this world, nor the things that it offers. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Jesus said this way in the last times. Listen to these words very carefully. This is in Matthew. In the last times, the love of many will grow cold. In the Greek, it's suko. Sounds like psycho, amen? People are gonna go nuts when it comes to love. You see, write this down. Not all love is the same. Now in English, we got one word. We're stuck with it, one word. And we can't make something up at this point because no one will understand. We got one word for love. But you see, in some cultures, when something's important, there are multiple words. Like for example, if you're an Eskimo, you got seven words for snow. But in English, we have one word for love. Well, here's the good news. The Bible wasn't originally written in English, it was written in Greek, and Greek is a far more precise language than English. Many of our medical terms, when you go to the doctor and you are diagnosed with an illness or they are diagnosing a part of your body or they are telling you something in a medical term, oftentimes our medical community will use the Greek language to describe something. That's why the words don't make any sense to you. It's because what you're really reading is Greek translated into English. That's why you don't know what department you're in when you're at a hospital. But the Greeks were precise about parts of the body and about describing things. And one of the things the Greeks loved to describe was love, and they came up with four words for love. And I think it's helpful. Not all love is the same. The first Greek word for love, I think we all relate to, and what we assume is that all love is this love. The Greek word is eros. It's where we get our English word erotic. It means sexual love, romantic love. This love is sexual and romantic. We see it in the Song of Solomon in the Bible. Song of Solomon 1, 2. Kiss me, kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. You see, Eros doesn't care about wine. It doesn't care about anyone else. Eros only cares about its object. Listen to me. Eros is powerful, but it is not permanent. Eros will, will make you fall in love, but it cannot keep you in love. The difference between eros and, and, and staying in love, literally eros is jumping into water, staying in love is swimming. And many of you fell into love, I just fell. And now you're drowning, you know why? You gotta learn to swim. Otherwise love in a marriage dies. Eros can drive you crazy. And the Greeks understood that erotic love was dangerous and must be controlled. In our world, what we say is you must submit all of who you are to Eros. And what the Greeks knew is that Eros must submit to you because Eros is like a fire. My wife loves fires. I don't know what it is about women, but you're always cold. My wife's always cold. We gotta start a fire. I'm like, it's 90? <laughs> Men burst into flames post 90. I tell her one day, it's, I'm gone. So she likes to have a fire. Fires are beautiful when they're contained. When they run out of control, they destroy California. Right? That's what Eros is. Eros must be managed. Arrow must be, eros must be controlled. Eros must be limited to. It is in the name of Eros that husbands leave their wives for another woman. It is in the name of Eros that moms leave their children for another family or another man. It is in the name of Eros that great harm is done to us when it is allowed to run rampant. And we live in a culture that says, follow your heart. That's Eros talking. 
It's powerful, it's real, it's not always bad, but it's not always good. The next love doesn't sound nearly as sexy. Storge. You're like, yep, that's what we have in our marriage. We have storge. <laughs> I storge you. I storge you. Doesn't it sound like you caught something? What happened to you? I got storge. <laughs> Look, storge is not sexy like arrows, but it's real. And so here's the thing. Eros is something that happens to you at some point in your life. Storge is always been there or it's not. You see, Eros is something happened when we're sexually attracted to someone, we find someone beautiful, we find someone captivating and we want them. Storge doesn't care how you look. See, this is the beautiful thing about Storge. You could, you could be ugly and you can have it, it's great. Like, you ever seen one of your friends post a picture of their newborn baby? Isn't he cute? You're like. <laughs> he looks like a 90-year-old man. I mean, <laughs> you know, no teeth. He poops his pants. See, it's the same. <laughs> right, but, but nobody falls in love with their baby because they're beautiful. They think their baby is beautiful because of Storge. Storge is just there. It's just always been there. It's something that's powerful. Storge is what you have for your grandma, and you don't know how powerful it is until she's gone. You see, that's how we, we experience Storge. It's not when we get it, it's when we lose it. Storge is familiar. Storge is safe. Storge is family. And Storge is important. Storge is the love of family. It's people that count on you and care for you, not because you're smart, not because you're beautiful, but because you're family. You're in. You're born into it. Storge is needed. Without Eros, none of us would be born, and without Storge, none of us would live. We need that. And it's in the Bible in Romans 12, 10. Show family affection, underline that. Show family affection to one another. That's Storge with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor. We gotta show Storge, listen to me. I know Sandals Church is a big church. I know we got lots of campuses. Here's God's heart for you. God's heart for you is that one day, Sandals would feel just like home. It's Storge. You just love it. You can't, listen to me, you can't imagine life without her. You look at people who don't love sandals and don't like sandals and aren't interested in sandals and you just don't get it because they don't have storge for sandals. It's your church and you can't imagine life without her. That's how I feel. That's how God wants you to feel. Romans 12, 10, here's another way it's translated. Love each other like brothers and sisters. You're like, I hate my brother. Well. It doesn't mean love each other like you love your brother. It means this, love each other like you should have loved your brother and sister. That's what it means. So if your family's jacked, you gotta learn a new way to experience storge. It's one of the reasons why the Bible commands over and over again for us to love each other because some of us don't know how. This next word, philios, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? Philos doesn't mean brotherly love. I don't know why they translated it that way. Philos means loving of friends like family. In the Bible, it's the way Jonathan loved David and David loved Jonathan. They were devoted to one another. Guys, this is why as male friends, we don't know how to say we love each other. Like, right, ladies, you're so good at it. I love you, I love you too. I love you more. Guys, man, if we're friends and one friend says, I love you, you're like. Right, and using the Greek word, we just make it weirder. Hey, bro, I phileo you. <laughs> you wanna do what? <laughs> I need a new best friend. But whenever you read in the old translations, like if you read the King James version of the Bible, it will say this, greet each other with a holy kiss. What that means is greet one another with friendship, affection. 
And for most of human history, we kissed our friends. But nowadays, because we live in, in an Eros dominated society, that's just weird. And if you go to many cultures outside of America, guess what they still do? They still kiss their friends. It means really, really care about one another, love each other. And here's the thing about friends. You don't always choose who you fall in love with. You don't choose who your family is. You do choose who your friends are. 25 times in the Bible, we are told to phileo one another. It's friendship. This is why you guys that fight me every single week when I say get into a small group and you say, I don't understand why I have to. It's just about me and God. It's because you've never listened to God. God says you need to learn to phileo one another. You need to learn to care. Listen to me, not just about your family, that's storge. By the way, guess how many times the word storge occurs in the New Testament? Once. You know why God doesn't feel like he has to tell you to love your family? Because most of you already do that. Jesus says this way, what good is it if you love those who love you? Even the sinners do that, that's what Jesus says. Jesus is not interested in challenging you to love your, your husband, your wife, your kids. That's normal. Loving total strangers of different ethnicities, just different socioeconomic status, different genders, that's biblical. Let us love one another like brothers and sisters. Hebrews 13, one, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. I don't know why they translated that way. The word is phileo, and it means love each other like friends. Deep, loyal friends. But there's another love. There's a deeper love that's beyond falling in love, eros. That's beyond family, storge. That's deeper than friends, phileo. This love in the New Testament, and it is the love that dominates your New Testament. It is used more than all the other virgins combined, right? It is agape. It is a love that is pure, perfect, and selfless. It is divine love. You see, one of our problems with our world today is we assume all love is the same. Listen to me, God's love for you is very different than your love for anyone else, including your love for him. 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight. You ever been in a wedding when they read this? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. Man, whenever I hear that, I'm like, I'm never falling in love. <laughs> love is patient. Anybody have kids? Raise your hand if you have kids. Is your love patient for them? Like the only time my love is patient for my children is when they're unconscious. <laughs> I lose my mind. I, my kids can't even order an In-N-Out burger. We, we go to In-N-Out burger and they're like, Hur. I'm like, it's one, two, or three. <laughs> There's no chicken here. <laughs> right, when the kids are little, every time you get out of the car, it's like it's the first time we've ever done this. Somebody lost a shoe, somebody's not wearing underwear, somebody puked. Love is patient. Love is kind. Do you know how hard it is for me to be kind? I love you, Tammy. Love does not envy or boast. My kid is an outstanding student. Starge. It's not agape. Godless parent. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. If you loved me, you would, right? It's not irritable, right? That means no man has ever loved. It's not resentful, ladies. Yeah, it's all funny when it's the guys, huh? <laughs> I resent that. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. I love it when Tammy's wrong. Ha <laughs> ha! It rejoices when the truth comes out. I'm always terrified when the truth comes out. Here we go! 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Just walk through your house. Don't love you, don't love you, don't love you. <laughs> right? Next time you're at a wedding, it's all about arrows. They want us to go so they can go be with each other. They didn't even want to feed you. This is agape love. It's not love. This is God's love. Agape love is patient. Agape love is kind. That's why God didn't zap you on the way to church today when you're like, I don't even need to worship you. Like if God didn't have agape, there would just be fire on Palmerita Avenue. God does not, God does not envy or boast. He's not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. God lets us be morons. It's not irritable or resentful. Man, God is so good and I'm so not. You don't have to amen that. That was an inappropriate amen. Amen, pastor, you're a sinner. Amen. All right. Only God's love can lead to true love. Beloved, listen to me, if you're a Christian, that's you. If you're not a Christian, God wants that to be you. Can I just be honest? I don't know if you're ever gonna fall in love. I don't know. I don't know if your mom and dad loved you. I don't know if they treated you right. I don't know if you're ever gonna have a best friend. I don't know, but I do know this. The love you need is from God. And it's not Eros, it's not Storge, it's not Phileo, it's Agape, and it's for you. Beloved, let us love one another. Let us, listen to this, let us agape one another. Let us love each other with patient, kind, not envious, not boasting, not arrogant, not rude love. Let us not insist on our own way. Let us not be irritable. Let us not be resentful. Let us not rejoice in wrongdoing, but let us rejoice in the truth. Let us bear all things. Let us believe all things. Let us hope all things. Let us endure all things. That's the kind of love God wants us to experience here. Whoever agapes has been born of God and knows God. Listen to me. Anyone who does not agape does not know God because God is agape. As Christians, we need to run around telling people that don't know Jesus they can't love their families because they can. We need to stop telling them they can't fall in love, they can't experience romantic love because they can. We need to stop telling people who don't know Jesus they can't have real friendships because they can. What they can't have is agape. And that's what God is offering. Only God's love can lead to true love. 1 John 4, 9, and 10. God showed us how much he agape us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real agape. Not that we agape God, but that he agape us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Jesus has a conversation with Peter. Peter said he would never deny Jesus. Peter said he'd be loyal to the end. But he denied Jesus three times. In Jesus' worst moments, Peter abandoned Jesus. Jesus rises from the dead and he has a personal conversation with Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? You wanna know what he said? Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. Jesus says again, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. And then Jesus says a third time, Peter, do you phileo me? Peter says, Lord, you know all things. 
you know I phileo you. You know what Peter's saying? My love wasn't enough, was it, Lord? Listen to me. I love you. Our love never is enough. If you're a parent, at some point, your child will become a teenager. And I know we have a lot of teenagers here. Look, I think it's hard to be a teenager. I would never want to do it again. But it's also hard to be a parent of a teenager. And oftentimes, through the teenage years, there are things that are said that are hurtful. And when our first child became a teenager, I'll never forget, we had one of those moments where things were said that will never be forgotten. And pain was felt that I never thought would, I would feel. And I was disciplining my oldest daughter, who was a new teenager, and she said, Dad, I hate you. I never thought I'd hear those words. No parent does. I said, Madison, I said, I know this is a tough night, but I love you. And she looked me dead in the eyes, and she said, what if I don't love you? Thank God I got a word from the Lord, and it wasn't killer. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, parents, if there was that verse? You can kill your child if it's lots of fun to make a new one. <laughs> Move on. That verse is not in the Bible. I looked. <laughs> she said, what if I never love you? And I heard God say, tell her how you feel. And I said, Madison, my love for you is not dependent upon your love for me. And she went to bed angry, and I closed the door and walked down the steps broken hearted. And I heard God say, and now you know, Matt, how I love you. And I was like, Jesus, stay focused. <laughs> Madison is a sinner. <laughs> Madison isn't the only sinner. Listen to me, love hurts, and now you know how God feels about you every day. Here's the good news. He doesn't eros you. He doesn't storge you. He doesn't phileo you. He agapes you. And his love for you <clears throat> is, not, is not dependent upon your love for him. Listen to me, God's love is a non-negotiable and you need it. You need it for your love life, you need it for your family life and you need it for your friend life and it's only found in Jesus, amen? Amen. 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 I love you guys, let me pray for you. Amen, you can give God a hand. <clears throat> amen. Let me pray for you right now. I want you to bow your head. I know some of you have had hearts broken and shattered by love. People have made commitments to you that they have not lived up to. People have said they love you, but they have lived a life that seems like they hated you. I want you to know that God is different, that his love is pure, his love is perfect, and his love never ends. His love is agape. Holy Spirit, would you just pour out your agape on this place? Would you mend every broken heart? Would you mend every marriage? Would you mend every relationship with our students to their parents and our parents to their students? Lord, if we have a grievance towards one another, if we're angry at our brother or sister, would you just pour out agape on us today? And would you let us love one another in the name of Jesus? We love you, God. Thank you for loving us. Amen.